Okay, we back with a quick story. This one is about a man who took his gangsterism from New York to down south. We are not going to waste any time, let's get into it. In early September of 2014, the New York Post released an article called The MacBoller Brims, NYC's Most Dangerous Gang. The MacBollers, also called the Maybach, was established by Larry O'Caldron. The article states the situations the MacBollers were involved in, such as Bronx prom queen Samantha Guzman dying in a spray of bullets on Mother's Day 2006, when she and her friends wandered into a MacBoller shootout in Morrisania. There was also Vada Vasquez, a Bronx student who miraculously survived being hit in the head with a stray bullet during a revenge attack on the gang by its well-armed rival, the Gorilla Stone Bloods, in 2009. We spoke about that, and a young man was arrested for that crime, check that story out if you haven't. Anyway, among the many names of the gang members included in this article, there is one we are going to speak about. His name, Kelvin Melton, aka, Dizzy. Dizzy was named as a member of the MacBollers when this article was released. Dizzy's criminal record dates to 1979 and includes convictions in New York for robbery and manslaughter. In the 1990s, Dizzy was serving a term of imprisonment at Rikers Island, New York, when he became a founding member of the United Blood Nation, UBN, an East Coast gang that shares the informal moniker, Bloods, with the original West Coast gang. From that time forward, Dizzy held various leadership positions within the UPN and its 1-8 tray set, commanding a loyal following. Dizzy's rank allowed him both to bestow ranks and privileges on other bloods and to order punishment for any gang infractions or threats to the gang. Although 1-8 tray started out under the auspices of UPN, it later disaffiliated from UPN. Dizzy is the godfather, that is, the head, of 1-8 tray, and its members continue to identify as bloods. Not sure if this is a nice way of saying they were fated or not. Anyway, in October 2012, Colleen Jansen won a conviction against Dizzy in a case involving a plan to kill a Raleigh man who was dating Dizzy's ex-girlfriend. The target in that plot was shot in the head and hand but survived. A Wake County jury acquitted Dizzy of attempted murder and criminal conspiracy, but he was found guilty of assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill, inflicting serious injury and being a violent habitual felon. He would be out the game for now, but he had hopes that he would certainly be back on the streets again. But because the jury found that Dizzy was a violent habitual felon, he was subject to and ultimately sentenced to a term of life imprisonment. While serving the sentence at Polk Correctional Institution, PCI, in Butner, North Carolina, Dizzy orchestrated a revenge kidnapping plot against his state court prosecutor and his defense counsel. He used a contraband cell phone to communicate with co-conspirators, fellow 1-8 Trey members and their compatriots, directing them throughout the scheme's planning and execution. The leader who masterminded a plot to kidnap a Wake County prosecutor has been sentenced to life in prison, a sentence he will likely serve in our country's most secure prison. One such member to be recruited to carry out this plan was Michael Gooden, a.k.a. Hot. Hot had already proven himself as a member of the Bloods, as two months before the kidnapping would even take place, Hot had committed a murder. His shotgun, which he nicknamed Sheila, delivered a fatal shot to the chest in a gang-ordered hit in 2014, in which the wrong man was killed. The incident went from shots fired to what's now being considered a homicide investigation. Monty Joseph Brabham, 32, was shot and killed minutes before noon on January 23, 2014, at the pumps of Murphy, USA near the busy Super Walmart. It's located off Russell Parkway in Warner Robins. In the Warner Robins killing, Dwayne Eric Seymour, aka Shooter, told authorities that Legarius Barfield was the intended target of a planned kidnapping, torture, if necessary, and ultimate killing. Shooter was originally charged in the Brabham slaying, but the charges were dismissed. Brabham, who was not affiliated with any gang, grew up with Barfield in Macon, Georgia, and on the day of Brabham's death, he was driving Barfield around to make some extra money. Brabham had agreed to drive Barfield to Warner Robins and later to Atlanta. Dizzy allegedly dispatched gang members down from Atlanta to the Warner Robins home of fellow gang member, Tiana Maynard. The plan was to lure Barfield to her home, where Tarp had been put down in the floor of a bathroom, according to the prosecution. Another person, Clifton James Roberts, testified at the trial of DeAndre Yarn that the Tarp was in case Barfield put up a fight or if they needed to torture Barfield to extract information. The gang members lay in wait for Barfield to arrive. 
Barfield testified at Yarn's trial that something didn't feel right and that he and Brabham decided not to go inside. Brabham and Barfield went next through the drive through at Saxby's and then to get gas at the adjacent Murphy's USA on Booth Road. The gang followed in Clifton Roberts' Chevy Tahoe. While Brabham was pumping gas, Hot and Yarn jumped out of the backseat of the Tahoe and came up behind Brabham. Brabham was shot in a brief struggle with Hot, who testified at Yarn's trial that the shotgun went off when Brabham reached for the handle. Yarn fired at Barfield as he ran away. Barfield tripped and fell as he ran, with gang members thinking he'd been killed also. It was said that Clifton Roberts was talking to Dizzy at the time the shooting happened. Brabham's silver 1996 Cadillac Fleetwood was stolen and later recovered by police, abandoned in a nearby neighborhood. All of the gang members were promoted after the killing, according to testimony at Yarn's trial. Yarn was the only one who was convicted at trial. Hot, Clifton Roberts and Tiana Maynard all pleaded guilty to murder and received life sentences with the possibility of parole as part of plea deals. But that wasn't before the second kidnapping and an attempted kidnapping took place, which Dizzy orchestrated. According to the indictment, Dizzy initially wanted Tiana Maynard and another woman, Patricia Kramer, to kidnap the sister of his court-appointed attorney from his 2012 trial. He instructed the pair in March to pull together a team to travel to Louisiana to carry out that kidnapping and arranged for each member of the team to receive about $10,000, the indictment said. Patricia Kramer found the address of the intended victim online. At least some of the other people rented a car and drove to Louisiana. They surveilled the target's residence for several days, communicating with Dizzy as he dictated who was in charge of the endeavor and suggested how to carry out the kidnapping. One night, co-conspirators jumped the fence on the target's property but fled when house lights turned on. They eventually abandoned the enterprise without kidnapping anyone. In late March or early April, Dizzy again called Tiana Maynard and Patricia Kramer. This time, he wanted them to assemble a team to kidnap Colleen Jansen, the assistant district attorney that won the conviction to put him away for life. The indictment said Tiana Maynard used the internet to find Colleen Jansen's address, but actually found her father's address. Quintavious Thompson, aka Quan, Jackham Tibbs, aka Jack, and Jenna Martin testified as to what happened. Early on April 5, Maynard, Martin, Quan and Jack left the Atlanta area for Wake Forest, North Carolina. Dizzy called them several times while they were on the road, at one point asking to be put on speakerphone to instruct each member of the team on their role. After he told them to wear khakis and collared shirts during the abduction, they stopped at a Walmart to buy new clothes. When they got to Jansen's home, Maynard waited in the car. Jenna Martin posed as a postal worker to get Jansen to open his front door. I moved to the side, and they forced their way in and knocked him down, taste him and hit him with a pistol, Martin said. I held him at gunpoint, Quan said. I said, I don't want to hurt you. I just don't want to hurt you. I told him to lay down. He resisted. I hit him on the head with a gun. Quan said his instructions from Dizzy were to kidnap Colleen Jansen if possible, or to get one of her parents. I knew I was in too deep, he added. After Jansen tried to escape, he and Jack beat Jansen again and used a stun gun on him so many times it ran out of power. His hands were then zip-tied and he was put into the back of a Nissan Versa where he was forced to lay on the floor. During the entire trip back to Georgia, Quan and Jack remained in the back seat with their feet on the victim's body, prosecutors said in the indictment. Martin was on the phone with Dizzy throughout the kidnapping, giving him a play-by-play -play count. During a couple of the calls, the phone was put to Jansen's ear. Quan said it appeared Dizzy was asking during one call where Jansen's family was. Y'all just don't know. You just did something worth it for me. Thank you all, Quan said Dizzy told the group on speakerphone on the trip back to Atlanta. Each of the four said they had no idea who Jansen was or why they kidnapped him, only that Dizzy wanted it done. In Atlanta, they handcuffed and taped Jansen to a kitchen chair and left him in the closet of an apartment bedroom without food or water. At 1.51 a.m., Jansen's wife began to receive text messages from a phone number with an Atlanta area code. The messages said her husband had been kidnapped. One text said her husband was in the trunk of a car en route to California. Another threatened her, saying that if she contacted law enforcement, we will send Jansen back to you in six boxes, and every chance we get we will take someone in your family to Italy and torture and kill them. We will do a drive-by and gun down anybody and throw a grenade in your window. 
If the kidnapper's demands were not met, her husband would be hurt, the text promised. Two days later, Jansen's wife received another text message at 12.19 am. The message included a picture of Jansen tied to a chair. It was said that Tiana Maynard was the one that sent it. Tomorrow we will call you again and if you cannot tell me where my things are at tomorrow, I will start torturing," the message said. Martin said she tried to clean Jansen's wounds at one point and started texting her boyfriend, trying to figure out how she got mixed up in the kidnapping. The bloods are in this house. I would like to live, she said she thought. As a white woman, Martin wasn't allowed in the gang, but she was introduced to Dizzy by her boyfriend, whose sister was dating the gang leader. After a few days, Dizzy ordered the group to kill Jansen, they said. Unbeknownst to the kidnappers, Jansen's wife had already gotten the police involved. They were able to connect those cell phone numbers to other messages being sent to a cell phone transmitting from inside the Polk Correctional Institution in Butner, North Carolina, where Dizzy was incarcerated. Investigators were also able to tie that prison number to calls being made to phones owned by Dizzy's daughters. Although Jansen had still not been located, the FBI tapped into a call between the cell phone from the prison and another number on Wednesday night. Two male callers were heard on the line. Prosecutors played for jurors the recording of what they say, was Dizzy calling from prison to provide instructions on how to kill him, dispose of his body and cover up the crime. I don't want to turn all morbid and stuff in front of the ladies, but you don't want it to be bloody, a man says in the recording. He told them to force Jansen to drink a bottle of cold NyQuil to make him sleepy enough that he wouldn't fight when they put a bag over his head to suffocate him. Get a bag, put it over his head, and stuff something in his mouth one person said, alluding to killing someone. The callers also spoke about digging a hole three feet deep and using bleach to clean up the walls. Make sure to clean the area up, one of the callers said. Don't leave anything behind. Don't leave any DNA behind. Officers at PCI approached Dizzy's cell for an inmate extraction. Dizzy had rigged the door to stay closed with a contraption he made from batteries and wire. One of the officers testified that as others were working on opening the door, he heard smashing sounds as if Dizzy was throwing something on the ground repeatedly. When the officers entered Dizzy's cell, they observed and recovered pieces of a cell phone. Later down the line the feds would reconstruct the device retrieved from Dizzy's cell and were able to identify it as the phone used to communicate with co-conspirators during both the Louisiana attempted kidnapping and the North Carolina kidnapping. They also extracted the messages exchanged between the phone and co-conspirators. As the plot unraveled, investigators said they determined Jansen was being held at an apartment on Atlanta's Newtown Circle. Meanwhile, the kidnappers went out to look for a place to bury the body. Martin said she never returned to the apartment after the second excursion, noting she heard police helicopters circling the neighborhood. The FBI's hostage and SWAT teams ended up finding and rescuing Jansen on a late night. He remained under medical supervision and was later reunited with his family. A few hours later, in the early morning hours, officers stopped Tiana Maynard, Clifton Roberts and Jenna Martin in Clifton's blue Chevy Tahoe. Inside, authorities found two shovels, a pick and a firearm owned by Clifton Roberts. The firearm, a handgun, was the same gun used by fellow gang member DeAndre Darnell Yarn in the killing of Monty Joseph Brabham. Hot would soon be arrested as well. Not sure what his actual role in the kidnapping was though. Jack and Quan were still at large. The feds were offering a reward of $25,000 for information leading to their arrests. Both were arrested less than a week later. Patricia Kramer was not previously identified as a suspect until she was named in the indictments. Her relationship to Dizzy was unclear. Everyone involved received lengthy prison sentences. Jack and Tibbs, aka Jack, 52 years imprisonment. Tiana Maynard 50 years in conjunction with a life sentence imposed by the state of Georgia for a homicide conviction. Quintavious Thompson, aka Quan, 42 years imprisonment. Clifton Roberts, 37 years imprisonment in conjunction with a life sentence imposed by the state of Georgia for a homicide conviction. Patricia Kramer, 30 years imprisonment. Michael Gooden, aka Hot, 30 years imprisonment in conjunction with a life sentence imposed by the state of Georgia for a homicide conviction. Jenna Martin, 25 years imprisonment. And then there's Yvonne Price, aka Flame, who received 20 years imprisonment, but we don't know what his role was. As for Dizzy, we believe he got a life sentence on top of a life sentence.
At the Jansen home in Wake Forest, April 5th, 2014 was a beautiful spring day. Frank Jansen had just returned from a Saturday morning bike ride. He had no idea he would soon be abducted, nor that he would spend the next four and a half days being terrorized and nearly murdered. It wasn't just a ordinary kidnapping if there was such a thing. Uh, it was a criminal who went after the family member of a prosecutor because uh, he didn't like the outcome of his case. Stephen Jessup and Dennis Kenny are the FBI agents who led the investigation. Local investigators already had a suspicion that Jansen's kidnapping may have something to do with his daughter's job as a prosecutor. And gang leader Kelvin Melton. She put the habitual felon in prison for life. It was you know, a threat against the system. Um, and it was very important that we send a clear message that that type of crime is not completely tolerated. The kidnappers, forcing their way in, zip-tied the 63-year-old and pistol-whipped him, leaving a trail of blood from the front door to the driveway. But right off the bat, investigators had a good lead. This is inside uh, the dining room area, inside his residence, and where we discovered a receipt for the McDonald's that was in South Carolina. Surveillance video at the McDonald's revealed the faces and eventually the names of the suspects. All were members of Kelvin Melton's gang. They were from Atlanta, where Jansen was taken, riding on the floorboard of a compact car and assaulted with a stun gun during the 400 mile trip. At one point during the six hour ride, he chewed through the plastic zip ties, jumped up and tried to grab the wheel to wreck the car. He failed. At that point, they stunned him again and then they pistol whipped him again. Once in Atlanta, Jansen was strapped to this chair, seen publicly for the first time outside a federal courtroom. It was placed inside a tiny closet in a rundown southeast Atlanta apartment. Not the most comfortable chair at all. And the, the door was closed right up against his body, and completely dark, and then he had a hood over, over his head. Four days later, Jansen, shrouded in darkness with little food and water, had no way of knowing the FBI had zeroed in on his location. Agents were monitoring phones used to send hostage demands and quickly realized Kelvin Melton was orchestrating the crime using a contraband cell phone smuggled into this Granville County prison. That's when they heard Melton give what they call the kill order. You really couldn't believe that you were hearing it. Uh, it was it was surreal. Just get a little bag and... Put that on my motherfucking head and, and lock it. And just, and you can't watch it, just walk away and run back a little while later, you know? Just how explicit that the instructions were and just how casually he gave them. You don't gotta really clean that shit in there for your dirt, you know? Put out uh, that, whole, that whole area in there got to be thoroughly bleached out. And then when you listen to the people in Atlanta on the other end of the call, they're laughing. I'm serious, <laughs> man. Prison guards immediately rushed Melton's cell at Polk Correctional Center in Butner. He barricaded the door and casually packed his things. The contraband cell phone that had been smuggled in lay smashed on the floor. At the same time, an FBI hostage rescue team quickly moved into place at the apartment in Atlanta. Agents who worked the case here packed into a conference room at an FBI office in Wake County, monitoring the rescue team's two-way radios. It was almost surreal listening. And then, of course, when you hear jackpot, we knew that they had him. I've never won the Super Bowl, but I imagine it's, it feels a lot like that. It was a big win. Death for Jansen was likely just minutes away. Gang members were caught later with shovels and a pickaxe, all covered with red clay. The only reason that the kidnappers were not in the apartment when the hostage rescue team went in and rescued them is because they were out digging the hole. I believe in the good Lord and I believe in good luck. And I think they all culminated with good investigation. And that's, that's where we had the outcome that we had. But despite the praise for the FBI, agents say Jansen is also responsible for his survival. He had a will to survive. He wanted to see his wife and children again. I think that's the reason why he's still with us today. But this about wraps this one up though. And as always, stay low and thanks for watching.